What is advanced? Does it simply mean challenging? Because if that were the case, any player who was challenged would ultimately mean that what they were doing was advanced. Trust me, that's not it. And speaking of that, is challenging really the goal anyway? Making something challenging for the sake of challenging is too arbitrary. Wearing a sumo suit, for instance, might make practice harder, but that's definitely not gonna make the game any easier. So back to the question at hand. What is advanced? Advanced simply means the abundance of detail. And beginner then, of course, would simply mean a lack of detail. This means that it's not necessarily the task that makes something advanced, but the level of detail within the task. Think of it this way. If basics were so easy, that means that everyone would be pretty good at the basics. And no one would be complaining about players these days lacking those basics. The reasons why basics or fundamentals take mastery is because the ones who have been detailed within them are the ones who truly possess them. The reason why all-time greats can spend so much time on the basics is because they found the deeper levels of detail within them. They found the advanced inside the simple. You know, some people look at our training at I'm Possible as advanced simply because it looks challenging to them. But in reality, our training is pretty foundational. After all, it's not generally the pro that needs the extra accountability of learning how to lower their shoulder or learning how to control their space or having to need accountability training at all. That type of training is generally reserved for the players who need it, the players who don't yet have those foundations. And that's why that training is much more foundational than it is advanced. It's only in our ability to increase or decrease details that determine just how advanced we want to be in any given session. And that's what Bryce Stanhope and I will discuss in our next episode of Dream Loudly. Welcome back to another episode of Dream Loudly. Today, Bryce Stanhope and I are going to be talking about what is advanced. And the context of this, I'm going to go ahead and just use an example of trainers we just had from China. So we have a trainer certification and we just went to China and trained 50 um, trainers to join our umbrella, become I'm Possible mm -hmm. certified. And then shortly after, I had a group of trainers come in from China um, to get certified. And here's the common theme that we see from our Chinese trainers is throughout China, our training is seen as advanced. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's um, just a bad view, an understanding of what our training actually does. And so what we want to actually talk about is how our training, the skill enhancement approach, is actually more beginner and foundational um, than anything else. Um, I think the better word is foundational, not beginner. Um, but let's go ahead and dive there. When people are looking at advanced, what do you think they're mainly thinking about? I, I think that's when they start really getting into like, in their minds at least, that there's a, a lot going on where like there's a lot of things you can pick out where like, like, you know, we could look at that from an athleticism standpoint. We could look at that from, you know, when trainers start teaching like combination moves, but like, I think that's what people start to think any of that is advanced is when they just see multiple different things going on, whether that's, you know, picking up a cone, um, grabbing a cone, you know, tennis ball, like everybody always thinks those things are so advanced because when you look at it, it might feel to them that there's a lot going on there and there's really not. I think that's probably pretty accurate. A lot of times, you know, people love our training and they'll say, you know, I can't wait till my, my kid is ready for that. Yeah. You know, they start looking at it as a, a standpoint of, yeah, but I got to build the foundation first. I got to get the fundamentals down. Mm -hmm. I got to get these basics mastered. And then we'll push that I'm possible advanced training on them. But the real magic of I'm possible and skill enhancement is literally the foundational. Yeah. You know, before we go further on this, let me just quickly give a definition that we've talked about before about what beginner and advanced is. And that's why I backtracked off of saying um, beginner, because really foundational and beginner is different. So if we were to say something is beginner, very simple definition, we just say it lacks detail. If something starts to gain detail, it becomes advanced. And so literally, advanced and beginner from that perspective just comes down to how much detail is being presented. So our training, when it's very detailed, can get very advanced. Mm -hmm. But the only thing you need to do to lower the advancement level is lower some detail. And so that's how we view beginner versus advanced. 
But what I mean about foundational would be that these are things that young players need. And the way that we teach players how to move, the way that we teach them how to drop their shoulder, the way we teach their body how to solve problems is what we're doing with I'm Possible Training and Skill Enhancement, and that's foundational. It's not advanced. But I think you're right. What they're looking at is the complexity of maybe what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the idea of dribbling a basketball and doing something else is just seen to the human mind as, oh, yeah. that's, that's getting more advanced. Well, th well, I think even when it comes, I mean, we've talked about this stuff for years. It's like we still have yet to have anybody give us a true answer to like, what is, a, what is the foundation? What are the fundamentals type stuff? And I think that's where people just kind of get lost. Like, I think it's just something that more sounds good to say and it feels like it's correct. Um, but no one's ever been able to give an answer of like, okay, like once I've got my player the ability to do this, 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 and this, now they're ready to take that next step of whatever. Now, you might have stuff as a trainer that you like to see your player do first. And we, we have that in the app too. Um, we've jokingly called it uh, the I'm possible fundamentals um, is what we've kind of jokingly called it. But like 10 things that if you can do these things that we teach through I'm possible, I can probably give you a pretty good, you know, run at almost everything else. But like that's been, I think the hardest part of when people start talking about that side of building a player's kind of like bases, they're typically missing the majority of stuff that it actually takes to even play basketball in general. And it becomes a more of a, a biased, subjective issue that, yeah. you know, who's to decide that a player is finally fundamentally ready? Mm -hmm. Or what, so first you have your basic list. So let's say a person's come up with 10 things that are so-called fundamentals. Then you have, okay, when have you finally achieved that fundamental? What's the measure? Well, how do you even measure that? And so if you're waiting to, to basically get all that stuff done and accomplished and mastered before you move on to the more advanced things, a lot of players won't ever move on because yeah. it takes a while to master something, even if it seems to be something simple. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we don't really base beginner and advanced based off of challenge. We base it based off of detail. Yeah. That's an easier way to, to measure things. And so we could come up with a list of fundamentals that would be the more easier stuff to attain. Well, that's where the, the Kyrie report kind of came in a couple you know months back and stuff is like, let's look at a player, like what are the really true top skills that he's using? And one of the least used skills on there was jump stops. And most people would be like, hey, this is one of the most important things that you need to learn but when we actually look at, you know, game data, what players are really doing, you don't see a lot of those true jump stops. So I, I think that's one of the things that we've always joked about is like, what are the true fundamentals of basketball? Like if we were going to create a list of that, like really, like what are they? Because they would probably be pretty different compared to what most of those people are saying building a foundation actually is. Yeah, if the foundation's not being used very often, then how important is it? Yeah. So that would be a, a fundamental classic footwork of a jump stop. Mm -hmm. And it happens. It's yeah. used, but it's not used nearly as much as other footworks at the higher levels. And maybe that's what happens with the fundamentals. Is you I feel stop. like even at the lower levels, though, I f rarely see a player actually like true, true jump stop. No, they do it because their coach do it. Yeah, that's about <laughs> it. If, you go to, if you're watching college, all you see is jump stops. Yeah. Because the college coaches are notorious for pushing, jump stop, jump pushing stop, that jump real stop. Heavy. So obviously you're going to see it. Uh, you know, just it, once you get to the pros, it starts to go away. So the question is why? Well, maybe because they were only forced to use jump stops mm -hmm. up until that point, and they no longer see it being as one of their main primary things to do. But that's why we, we try not to, you know, boil the game down to here's your fundamentals, here's your intermediate, and here's your advanced. In the end, they're all just skills. Yeah. And you can take all those skills and you can make them more advanced by adding detail and you can make them less advanced, more beginner by taking detail away. And we, and we always talk to our trainers about that too, about like dripping the details and you're not always just throwing everything out there at once because then it does become pretty advanced where it's like, you know, a younger player probably isn't going to have as much of that ability to digest a ton of detail. So if I just maybe give them this detail and this detail and have them run at it, they're going to have a much better chance. And that's one of the things that our, our trainers, you know, learn through the process of the certification is like, 
how to kind of start taking the things that you learn as a trainer and kind of know when to put them out there and when to be like, okay, I want you to just focus on this and this. So making it less advanced by, like you said, like giving it just a few things and then taking a player that, you know, really is getting into this, making it more advanced by giving them just more detail on top of that. Yeah. Let me go ahead and give an example too, for everyone who's watching uh, of just a good example. So let's take a jump stop since we already talked about it. If I told a player just to do a jump stop, most of them already know what it is. Mm -hmm. I gave them no detail. So I keep it very implicit. I just say, I want you to do a jump stop right there in the paint. A player is going to do that in their own way, and that's very beginner. There's no detail attached to it. But how do you make a jump stop more advanced? Well, then you got to add some detail to it. So the first phrase of this would be, okay, I want you to jump stop in this way. So if I was doing a two-dribble drive, I would say I want you to do a skip into a jump stop. Now, a skip would be skipping off the inside foot right after your dribble step. Still pretty beginner, mm -hmm. but because I gave them a very specific act of how to perform the jump stop, I just made it a whole lot more advanced or at least a little bit more advanced. Yeah. Then if I wanted to make that jump stop even more advanced, now I could have them try an inverted skip, which would be now skipping off of the outside foot. And so picture you're going down your same two dribble drive, but now instead of doing it right off of the dribble, you take one step after your last dribble, you're skipping off your outside foot and into a jump stop. A lot of players have a really hard time yeah. with that timing into that jump stop. So that's just a very uh, quick example of how you can make something that seemingly is beginner and actually make it more advanced just by adding detail. So that's just kind of a rough overview of the subject. However, when people are looking at our training, is grabbing a cone advanced is snatching a rip cone advanced because that's what they're looking at is they're saying oh that's multitasking yep. you're having them you know lower the shoulder grab the cone and drive i wouldn't do that with a beginner player i gotta wait till they can do the the foundation first so is it is grabbing a cone advanced what's your answer again it, i think it still just comes down to the way you teach it but for the most part doing this for a long time between you know, back in the day when I used to run, you know, little kids programs out in New Jersey and stuff, like to me, it's not advanced at all. I've seen little kids who do that better than what my high schoolers when they first do it. And I, I and we've talked about this um, in the past a little bit. I think a lot of it comes down to people underestimating a player strictly just due to age and where they're at, where we, we've seen it all the time, like players who come in that you know, they bring in their young, you know, third, fourth, fifth grader, whatever it may be. And they're like, oh, they're just kind of starting and so-and-so. And then within a day or two, they're amazed at what their kid is actually doing because it actually wasn't at all that advanced for them. They just needed to actually give it a shot for a couple minutes and then, then boom, they get, they get it quick. Um, and I think that's one of the things where like, like even taking a cone grab. In the beginning, if you look at the first couple reps, like, yeah, it'll look like it's above their head. The coordination of it. You know, they grab the cone, they lose the ball. But, like, you give them two to three minutes to work through something, the body, even with a young kid, the body adjusts so quickly. What, what is that called? Malleable? I think it's malleable is what everybody yep. likes to call it. Yep. But, it like, kids just, like, they can pick up things so quickly. Where I think that's where they get underestimated. So I personally don't think that action is advanced for a young player to be doing to this extent of like, oh, they need to be able to do this before they do that. And if it was advanced, then how can we have so many young kids who can yeah. pull it off? Yeah. And so my answer to the Chinese trainers there would be, first off, let's just examine. If you take all the NBA trainers, so, you know, for the ones who are known for training NBA players worldwide, we would be on that list and there'd be a list of other people. Mm -hmm. But then if you first looked at, okay, now how many of those NBA trainers also train kids? We're one of the only ones yeah. on that list. Most NBA trainers, and I know we've talked about this before, do not train kids. Mm -mm. Um, really, what they're doing isn't all that advanced, but they're doing more of the stuff that pros need, going through their situations, giving them shots, not all really that challenging but, the re but it's not going to do much for a kid either because the kid doesn't have the foundation that's built up to really make anything out of that. There's only so much spot shots that are going to help a kid because they need so much more. So a lot of times NBA trainers aren't training kids because they're not built for the foundational level. 
Now, we're ones who actually do train kids, so let's examine why that is. So the reason why we train kids and pros and we do it the same way is because at the very heart of Impossible, we are not advanced, we are foundational. Mm -hmm. And the better you create that foundation, the more detail can be added, which then of course can become you know, more advanced later on. My favorite example of this is the classic Kobe clip of him training the WNBA girls where oh, yep. Kobe's trying to get them to get their shoulders low. It's literally the, the best evidence that I have for this, and that's I use it all the time when I'm training players to show them. I may have even talked about it in a past podcast a little bit, but he's trying to get their shoulders down. You can see it. He's pointing at the floor. He's trying to get them to do it, and they're just not moving like him. Yep. And so you can watch him at, at a couple of the clips. He drops his shoulder, and his hand is close to the floor. Yeah, it's almost on the floor. Yeah. He's not touching anything. He's not grabbing anything, but he knows how to move. Mm -hmm. He has personal accountability. He has self-awareness. He knows how to move, and they're not doing it. So he's having them do the same motion, but they're not able to achieve the same detail. So the problem is they needed to add something foundational to mm -hmm. teach them to move, like grabbing a cone, like touching an object, in order to match Kobe's movement. And that's a great example for explaining how our training is not advanced it's actually teaching players how to move in a more pro-like way but it's just teaching them the foundations of basketball so kobe needed to give them those tools in order for them to get those foundational qualities that kobe had to me that's one of the best examples for yeah. it it's not advanced it's just giving the pieces that otherwise the players aren't going to get on their own and that that clip i mean is probably three, four years old now, maybe four or five years old now. Um, but that's something we've always talked about a little bit is like you do have some players out there that just get it. Like, and obviously that's one of the Kobe's like famous, you know, interview speeches where like, and we, we use it a lot too because it's a perfect example of what we look at is like, you know, I look at clips and pictures of Jordan. You know, I look at his angles of feet. I look at this. Like some players are very good at looking at that and then just – doing it on their own. Like you said, they have that, they have that personal accountability. Um, and that's where we've always talked about our training. You know, if a player already has the ability to do something, maybe they're already getting that low. Do I need to do cone grabs with them, cone pickups? No, I could do it from a standpoint of challenge them, see if it knocks anything loose a little bit. But like, we've always talked about that to an extent is like, I can always use that accountability with them. I can see if maybe it throws anything off or if I can find any challenges. But for the most part, if they already have it, we'll probably move on to something else. So we can always kind of pick in place what we want to do with those accountabilities. Um, but a lot of times, like even if you know, we have a player that's playing low and it seems good, that simple cone grab might just knock off the way they were handling the ball. It jars something loose. It throws something off. So they still get something out of that, even though it's not just the, hey, they've already been low. But now it's just, you know, even breaking it down to something as simple as, you know, it throws off their hand coordination or something like that. But I, I think that that's one of those clips that, you know, when we saw that, I mean, and the, the, the players he was working with were considered really good players in that. WNBA. Yeah, like they're, they're notable players and stuff and, you know, Kobe's given simple direction and like they feel like they're doing what he's doing. But again, since there's no real accountability there, like you weren't even really close. Like you might've felt like it cause you were lower than what you were used to, but you still weren't in the realm of what he's doing. And that, and you touched on it. Methods are not just for the challenge. They can be, but they're mainly to showcase weaknesses mm -hmm. and see if a player needs something. And if they don't need it, then we won't do it. Yeah. And Kobe, again, in that example, did not need to touch a cone or grab an object. And so if we were training Kobe, I can guarantee you I wouldn't have done one single rip cone how many, snatch. How many Kobe's out there have you worked with? Not very many. <laughs> but if I were, yeah. I wouldn't have him do any rip cone snatches. Yeah. But if I was training those same WNBA girls, I would. Yeah. So if the rip cone snatch was so advanced if what we're doing with accountability training is so advanced we would do it with all of our pros but we actually do it less with our pros because those accountability tools and methods are mainly needed for players who aren't at that level yeah. if a player already has the skills and the tools and, and the abilities then we use less and less and less of those accountability methods 
And that's why I think people need to understand the flaws in that logic and reasoning. Because like I said, if it was advanced, we would be increasing it with yeah. all of our NBA guys, not decreasing it. And, I, and I've seen you do that in those workouts with players too, like higher level players where like, you know, you go into it, you're going to kind of, you know, do a certain method with them and then they crush the method. So you spend barely any time on it. You already have it. So we might as well, you know, move on and see what else. Like we've always talked about, we're a very flaw driven training system. Like we want to find what you're bad at. I'm not going to sit there and work on what you're good at for 20 minutes for the sake of working on it. Like you already have that. Um, and I, I think that's, what's really special about our system and the way we train is it's not really geared towards an age. Like it's geared towards a skill level. We have a, we have a local kid right now who, uh, trains with one of our local trainers here at the world headquarters. I think he's nine. His dad was like a four year point guard at Minnesota University, and for a nine-year-old, skillfully, he's pretty dang advanced right now. But he's still going through those stages where, you know, he was working um, with Josh with a kid that I think was like a 10th grader the other day. And the skillful difference between the two was a lot. Like, uh, I want to say they were doing uh, pin and peels or something. The nine-year-old was picking it up faster than, you know, the 11th grader is. So like it's so based upon your foundational skill level than it is really anything else. And, and like we always talk about, they should eventually graduate yeah. every skill that we give them. So if someone goes through our checklist training system, we use a method, they crush it, they'll never use that method again. Mm -hmm. They'll move on from it. If we use a method and they struggle with it, now it, it goes into the bank of, okay, here's some weaknesses they need to work on. So it's literally more of a diagnostic tool than it is a tool to challenge. Yes, it can challenge, but I think people are looking at it through the wrong scope. Yeah. They're looking at advanced and challenge as the same thing. Can we not challenge an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old? Would that make it advanced? Or if you're challenging eight or nine-year-old with something they don't yet have, a skill that they might not be perfect at, is that, does that make it advanced or does that make it training? Yeah. So that's why in the beginning I talked about advanced being detailed, beginner being lack of detail, because that's a better measurement than just based off of how we perceive yeah. challenges. I agree. And I think a lot of times people are training players by making it challenging for the sake of challenging. Yeah. I see this happening in um, some of the different various approaches that we've already talked about in the past. The CLA approach, they talk about challenge, you know, and, and sometimes it feels like in training that's all someone's trying to do is challenge them. That's trying to make it advanced for the sake of making it advanced, yeah. but they're doing it without adding any detail. So that's where I think it loses a lot of the value of the challenge. If I, I've joked about this before, if I wanted to make something challenging, make practice hard so the game is easy, I could put everyone in a sumo suit and I have them train that yeah. way. I can make it, make it really challenging, yeah. but it's not going to get much out of it. The real challenge we want is not just making something difficult. The real challenge is to give them something that they're just slightly above their head in a detailed perspective they're trying to reach for. That's real training. A footwork they don't yet quite have. That's not advanced. It's just a little bit more detailed, something they haven't experienced before. And some of the simplest things in basketball, like dribble step timing. Yeah. Could be something a player, even at a high level, doesn't yet have. Definitely not advanced, but if they don't have it, we need to give it to them. So we need to just start looking at each skill as something someone should needs to obtain. And training tools and methods are just used to help players achieve them. So that's a healthier way to look at the topic. Yeah. So if anyone was looking at our training, hey, are you guys just advanced? Are you just reserved for pro players? No. No, it's, the, it's, it's quite opposite. We train pros and we look for their weaknesses. They have a whole lot less than you. Yeah. So our training, the majority of the training we're known for is even more relevant for younger players, middle school and high school, who are still trying to get those characteristics 100%. and qualities. One of my favorite examples was, was Victor Oladipo with the rip cone snatch. Or no, it was a cone slide. He hated them. In the beginning, he needed them because his dribble step timing wasn't quite right when his body got low. Yeah. So he was getting close though, and I remember you know, we were doing it one more time. I was like, look, we're gonna do this one more time. You're really close to never needing this again, and if you crush it, we will never ever do this method again. I think it was just the third time we did it, which usually third time is the, char is the, yeah. is the charm. He crushed it, 
I said, all right, we graduated from it. And he literally like cheered and made a joke of like never having to do it again. But the reason why that was the case is because we accomplished the skills that the method was intended to do. So we no longer needed it. We move on. That's how our training works. I think people have a struggle, a struggle with that part too, though, is like realizing you can just move on from something. You have it. You don't need to practice overhand layups anymore. You have it. Yeah. Move on. Just like we've talked about players have natural ceilings, methods yeah, have a ceiling absolutely. too. absolutely. The Mikan is the one that a lot of people trash on. But if you do the Mikan, you're going to get better to a certain point. Yeah. And then it has a very clear ceiling that you no longer need it You anymore. don't need to do this. Anymore. If you still want to do it, fine. As a warm-up, great. That's all the power to you. But it's probably going to reach a level where it's yeah. not going to really give you gains anymore. And that's all training can really get to that point. So, But like I said, when you do hit that point, don't just raise the challenge just for the sake of raising the challenge. Raise the detail, and the challenge will go with it. And that's what we do better than anybody else. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up another episode of Dream Loudly. Kept it short for you today, just on the topic of beginner versus advanced. Hope you got a lot out of that, and we'll see you next week with another episode.